You just cycle in? I'm like, no, it's just kind of part of the thing. It's part of your uniform. It's part of, it's part of the brand. It's like uh, Dr. Disrespect has the mustache and Absolutely. the wig and you have your hiking. <laughs> it is, but there's a secret to it, is that I started doing the UK convention circuits and, um, and it's cooler. Because some of those are hot. This is actually quite a cool convention. I but I don't know. You've been around the U.S. ones. I mean, are they, are they typically? You're in a. You're obviously in two I'm in layers. A hoodie. Yeah. So you're comfortable. But yeah. uh, normally, I find if you're in anything more than a t-shirt, like yeah. it's hot. It's uncomfortable. Right. And you want yeah. to be focused on meeting people, not like right. sweat. I'm and usually then... inside, in air conditioning. So. Yeah, but in the U.K., we don't have an issue with outside being too hot, <laughs> but it's inside, you know. Yeah. But um, there's a great, there's a great convention, definitely the best one in the U.K. circuit called Rest. Okay. And it's like all indies. It's uh -huh. like this two-level place. Really cool. It's almost got like almost like dungeon-like uh, arches, archways underneath. And like I spent like an hour and a half with like Dean Hall and his team just sitting down there and just shooting the breeze. And it was right. like, and no one was flooding him. I was like, what is this? It's like yeah. this is just so. And it was just open air, really comfortable. But it does. It helps to be in kind of gear that. Uh, number one makes you visually distinct. Yeah, so people yeah. know, you know, it's you like, stuck oh, out. It's like, oh wait, oh I recognize that guy's face. <laughs> See him on Twitter. But it's it's but. another branding thing, right? Like when you think about I'm gonna establish a brand, what am I gonna do? Loads of people were like, Oh well I'm gonna put a VR headset on to make me distinct. Right. And I just thought, you know, and this was three years ago, I was like but I want I want them to know me, right. not you know, the dude with the box on his face right. and no right. eyes. And right. Well it worked. So I guess it job. did. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. So. Cool. So this is really weird for me because it's like I have two contexts. I'm not usually live streaming yeah. at the same time as I'm recording. So well, um, I should tell people. So guys, we had a little issue with the camera. The front-facing camera wasn't working. So unfortunately, I'm staring at the back of my iPhone. So I can't see what you're saying. Which, <laughs> so is, which is great for me because I'll have your full attention, but yeah, it's not so great for the live streamers. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to connect later. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, but yeah, I do the Voices of VR podcast, and this is what I do. I come in and just grab people from the VR community and see what's going on. So I'm, I'm going to learn all about you because I, I know little or nothing about you, and I'm going <laughs> to learn everything right now. All so, right, oh, good. Are okay. you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell me a bit about what you're doing in VR. Sure, so uh, formerly my, uh, my handle alias is uh, ZimTalk5. My name is Brad, Brad Payton. Uh, so in VR, I'm a, uh, I'm a VR Twitch streamer, I suppose one of the originals. I, I don't say necessarily the original, as there's uh, Cinematic Bruce, who I high-fived and hugged yesterday. I think we got on really well, actually. I did, you never know when you're far away. But we've been doing uh, Twitch shows for the last you know, four to six, uh, four to six nights a week for the last three years. Um, started when I cracked open my DK2 box after having waited five months for that to arrive. And then uh, with my wife's idea, it was, well, why don't you just, why don't you just stream it and share it with me? And um, we were in Scotland at the time. We just moved up there with our uh, kind of young family and decided, look, this is a this is a really good good idea just to be able to share with people. We didn't have any friends in the area, and so we live on Twitch, and then Reddit picked it up, and it went nuts. And you know, before long, for a guy who had at that point you know 40 followers, uh, we had 100 people watching, and I was like, well, this is just nuts. And within two within two weeks, we had. Literally, we had an evening where I had 2,100 people, you know, watching me play Minecraft in VR, and it was like this is just nutty. So I really enjoyed it. Um, when you share with people, one of the big benefits of it is that you get a lot back. There's loads returned. People come in and give you recommendations about, okay, well, you can overcome this problem this way. Have you tried that piece of software? Have did you talk to this guy? You know, so. You establish very quickly this digital family that you can pick up and bring with you anyway. And honestly, from a day or two days not streaming, I'll feel a little bit isolated or lonely. It's like I need to be sharing this stuff with my people. You know? And I think that's the beauty of being a Twitch streamer and the attraction to it is being able to establish a family who's not your blood family and bring them with you wherever you go, provided the Wi-Fi and, and 3G <laughs> hold up. Because some conventions I've been to recently, unfortunately, didn't work out that way. But thankfully here at Oculus Connect, it's been nice. So it's been a good, it's been, been a good start, you know? And so three years doing this, VR only, and uh, we've been doing some kind of IRL streaming. That's a different separate channel on Twitch. And it's been, it's been a really, 
fun ride just to kind of take it step by step by step. And we actually have two channels, and so I suppose people always ask you that that size question of well, you know, how big are you, how many followers, how many subs do you have? So on Twitch we have uh, on the main channel that's got 11,000 followers, and another kind of two and a half on our reruns channel. So we've got a 24 by 7 run um, of all of our old broadcasts and a couple of fun segments like just little funny bits, you know, me and a reindeer outfit saying something silly, all that kind of stuff, just to liven people up and give them something a bit different. And my wife and I also developed a game that goes hand in hand with that as well, that's a social multiplayer experience. So we're just kind of coming at it from a couple of different angles. We like to just ask ourselves the question of how do we how do we be better, how do we do uh, something different than other people are doing and keep things fun and lively. Yeah, well, I have so many questions about VR streaming, because first of all, uh, most of uh, streaming in VR is from the first person perspective and so you kind of are moving your head around which tends to get people, some people motion sick or it's, all, it's sometimes also not the best view of what's actually happening and so um, I've found that sometimes if you have a third person perspective that's better but then if you're locomoting then that, so like for you, have you found that that has been an issue to have a first person perspective streaming or have you found that it worked better? For viewers, I think yeah, that's what viewers, you're asking. Yeah. Um, so for viewers, generally no. Some of the faster paced games can cause someone, if it, they're really erratic, the, the, the challenge is that someone who's tracking the motion of another person is using their eyes and trying to like garner information from, these, from the scene. And if you're moving too quickly around the environment, then they, you know, again, as you said, it can be uncomfortable to watch. But in general, probably 80, 90% of cases, perfectly comfortable. If you're broadcasting, and something I always say to people, if I'm having them before they hop in the seat for stream, because sometimes I invite people over and they have a go, um, is if you can just be conscious when you turn your head or make you know, motions, then you can slow that by 10% and make that a little bit more watching. It's the same thing as if you have like a live stream broadcast and the signal starts to get a bit choppy and things become this mesh mess of artifacts and kind of like jpeg artifacts in the, in the video stream. Similar to that. You don't want to fling them through so much information at a time. But at the same point, sometimes, whether you're you know in a horror game and reacting to that or you're in a you know, music beat game, you're just jumping around the place because I'm quite an energetic fellow, um, yeah, it's just kind of part of the show. And to be honest, what helps that is our presentation style. So really early on, actually, the, the first day we went live, um, we came up with what I call the 50-50 split, which is half the scene is made, half the scene is you know an eye or a view into the game. And we leverage that more often than not. And what it allows people to do is basically just very easily keep an eye on what the person is, how they're reacting get full detail in the face and the eyes and all that. And I'm quite an emotive guy anyway, so people like to pick up on that. I'm also quite a Yelpy guy. We'll go into stories about that a little bit later. Um, and then on the other side, you've got the, the scene. And so, you know, the streamer's, um, you know, produce, producer, um, what can I say, characteristic is to always be thinking about what's best for my audience to be looking at right now. Is it a full scene? Or is it, maybe I can go, on, go back to 50-50, because if I'm playing a scary game, half the information is what's on scene. Half the information is Zim's feckin' terrifying. So I, I found that that's really successful. And actually, it was really funny, because during the keynote, they were doing a 50-50 split or a 60-40 split on the game. And I was like, we coined that. <laughs> but it's, it's something that I actually, I'm surprised it hasn't, more people haven't used that. Because the, the kind of typical 2D streamer, right, would have easily 90 or 80 percent of the scene be the game, and 20 percent be in them. But I'll be honest, when I watch a stream, this is why we developed it this way. I'm actually more interested in the person than the game. I want to get to know the person. I want to get to know what they're like, what they're what they're you know afraid of. Are they partnered with somebody? Uh, where are they going in life? All those things. You know, in addition to oh, this is an exciting game. And typically, does that person have an opinion? Do they, is there something that they uh, they can give to me? Or as, as we were talking just before uh, clicking the record button, is there somebody who's like really good? Because I think you're either you're either an entertainer because you're funny, or um, or even you're just sorry to say this, but like kind of a dumb guy. Like there's some people on on Twitch who they totally pump it up. It's like 
I just act like a fool, like a complete buffoon, and you're gonna watch me. You might even hate me watching me, but you'll enjoy the fact that you're watching me. So I, I fit somewhere in the category. I'm certainly not a skill streamer, uh, unlike some of my favorites on, on, on Twitch, but it's it's really a great thing just to be able to, to share with people. And also, like I didn't know for myself before I got started streaming that I was a Yelpy film. That, you know, when a little girl jumps in front of your view or, you know, all of a sudden, like, there's one of the things on the floor there uh, where I literally shouted out, you know, <laughs> very very feminine scream as well. But I didn't know that I was that kind of guy because I didn't like horror games before. Because, of course, they scare you and it's like, well, I, you know, I wouldn't have chosen that. But now, because I know it's entertaining, I'll do it. Um, but I won't do, you know, I won't do, like, jump scares and stuff like that twice, because having tested that, it just doesn't work. And that's why when I sit down with a, with a developer and these conventions, I normally just network. And I'll say, they'll say, hey, do you want to hop in the game? And I'll say, no, because I've got a show to put on. And when I play your show, when I play your game, if I play it a second time, the drop off is, is actually extreme. It goes from 100% normal reaction to, I'd say, 20%. So if I play a jump scare game, you're going to get 20% of reaction out of me. So it's almost a throwaway. Yeah, I, I found that as well in terms of uh, just my own reactions of, of playing the game, but also uh, often I'll be in conversations with people and they'll be like, all right, stop, we got to hold it for the podcast because if we talk about it too much, then we talk about it before we talk about it, then we talk about it on the podcast, and then we've already talked about it. And there's no energy there, there's no vibrancy. And I think that that's the thing that I see that's really interesting about VR is that you're really trying to achieve this state of presence. Now, the tricky thing that I don't understand about Twitch is that you're almost having to split your attention between the outside <laughs> world and the chat and your community. And how do you maintain a sense of social presence with these people that are watching you and interact with them, but yet at the same time, you remain completely present to your experience and have that authentic reaction. Uh, have you ever seen a, uh, an image of someone spinning like four plates and some of them crashing? That is the balancing act. Um, and it's actually something that I'd say only in the third year, only this year, it's kind of clicked for me what what that takes from you as a drain. Because it's the fact that your brain needs to process two realities at once and be very much always in both realities. You can't afford to break that. And so you end up, I think, when I'm in VR, in particular because I've trained myself into this way, I'm, for instance, I'm in the Rift headset. I'm through the nose hole looking at chat on a monitor. People often, they come into my You're show. You're looking through a nose hole at That the is chat. my trick. That is wow. my trick. It's not, a lot of people say, oh, how do you get software? How do you get chat in the Rift? Simply put, angles. Like, I've set my setup so that I'm perfectly, I know exactly where chat is. I'm very good at pinging that with my eyes every, say, 20 seconds, so I can see if people are asking me, and I can react to that. At the same time, I might be, you know, evading someone who's coming at me with a chainsaw in Resident Evil. You know, these things, that's that's the way it goes. So I'm actually, as an interesting uh, impact, like people always ask you, like psychological effects of, you know, being in VR for long periods of time, any physiological effects, do your eyes hurt, do you get a headache, any of that kind of stuff. And for somebody who's done several blocks of like, you know, 18, 16 hour streams, I can answer those questions. Very early on, I had an interesting thing whereby I'd be driving on the road. This was in the DK2 days. Driving on the road, and my eyes wanted to focus more on the horizon than what was, let's say, at medium distance in front of me. And so it was kind of like an unfocusing. So some people would, so my eyes had been trained to kind of basically unfocus because the, it's like looking into a mirror using a rift. Some people think, oh, it's like looking at text really close. It's not like that at all. It's like, taking your focal point and going out more towards infinity. And so if you get used to having your eyes in that relaxed state, my eyes when I was driving was, was going relaxed. And I have to consciously kind of focus that a little bit to look at a car that was maybe five car lengths above. So that was the first effect that I ever felt. And that, that kind of went away. That was a transient. But that was around like months three or four after having done this, you know, six, four to six times a week for that period. I was like, wow, am I going crazy or is this actually a real effect? So that was the first thing. Thankfully, there's not been anything like my eyes falling out, or but you don't know. You know, you get into this stuff and you go, "I'm a pioneer. I have to decide. Am I going to throw myself on the tracks and just say, it's cool technology? It could hurt me. Just humans don't know. You know? Um, and you just go, you just go with it. So I made that conscious decision. I said, you know, it's worth, it's worth the risk. I've looked at the technologies. Seems safe enough. 
don't think I'm going to cause myself to have any degeneration in my eyes. So, okay, go ahead. And it's been fantastic going through all the headsets. I, I run all three headsets. And um, in terms of kind of that effect, it's weird, but it'll tire you out faster. And I think it's because, I, I bring it back to kind of computing. You're almost like, I don't know, you wouldn't call it, uh, you wouldn't call it like overclocking. But it's a bit like that, because whatever processor is up there is having to deal with two realities at once. You know, dealing with the chance that my wife might poke me on the side while I'm, you know, in some, some scary game or in the middle of driving something. And at the same time, trying to just remain aware of, of obviously, the audience, you know, who's, who's interacting with me, who's asking questions, who's saying, oh, watch out behind you because they're just trying to troll you, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really interesting balance. And the, the time when I find it most difficult to maintain that balance is if I'm in like a super fast-paced racing game. You know, something like, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of like Red Hour, which is ultra, ultra fast. I mean, we're talking like Wipeout or F-Zero fast, um, competitive, like don't blink, right? Faster than even Thumper. And, and with that kind of thing, when you're trying to like be competitive and at the same time, entertain the audience and be aware of their needs and focus on the scene at hand, you can be pulled away from that and then go a little bit quiet. And so that's the main balance for me where I find a challenge. Hmm. Well, it sounds like that with the Rift, you're sitting down and looking at the screen, but there's also experiences where you're standing up, yeah. even with the Rift, or you have a room scale experience with the HTC Vive. So how do you keep an eye on a chat window when you're moving around a room scale experience while you're standing up? So it's, it's a very similar experience. It depends on the headset. So PSVR is probably the toughest because I've got chat on the display on the just like when I'm on the Rift. So if, I, if I'm doing kind of standing, oftentimes it's more of a, I go into batch processing. So every, instead of every 20 seconds, it's every two minutes I'm checking. And thankfully, for the types of things we broadcast and for the fact, the simple fact that when someone logs into a Twitch stream and they see this, there's something in your brain, uh, sorry, for those who are listening, I'm covering my eyes. Um, if you don't have the, the eye connection, your immediate um, impression is, okay, I, I can't really say something to this person because they're not seeing me. And so to get around that, I've got a great mod team. I've got a team, uh, we've got some technology as well. So one of the things that I had you earlier was this endpoint. And with that is loaded 25 Zen points. It's our own little currency. What does that allow you to do? One of the things is message me. So if you, I had a coder from the Czech Republic help me out and build this little system. And um, if, if someone sends a message using a little prompt, it'll voice it out. So I can be in the game and someone can say, you know, no game screen, for instance. And this is the biggest falling down point I've seen for the Twitch streamers who try to foray, even, even experienced mega Twitch streamers, foraying into VR. I've seen people sit there with a black screen for 15 minutes because they have no way for the audience to let them know we can't see anything. And so those are some of the main hurdles of the Twitch streamer, I think. And the questions I usually get are, well, how do you get to see it? You, ask, you said, like, sometimes you're in first person and maybe that's not the best way for an audience to view it. One of the things that we struggle with is you'll have, you know, you'll have a an environment and a capture window. And there wasn't when Oculus rolled their first you know, SDKs, there wasn't a standard. Back in the day of the DK2, they had this lovely, everyone will remember it, it had these kind of like vignetting cold black corners around this eye. It was a very Oculus shape. And and that was very easy because you basically take one eye, do the 50-50. Away you go, you're sorted. That was kind of a standard. But they almost broke that standard when the CV1 came out. The development software stack changed. And I've got some games that won't give a mirror window at all. Some games, and this is from a capturing perspective, so they won't give a mirror window. Mirror window's stretched and isn't pixel perfect, which bugs me like crazy. Or, you know, it's, it's a kind of a funny shape, or it's zoomed in. Like Elite Dangerous is one game where I said to, said to the guys from Frontier, I said, look, you gotta fix your ability to stream because it used to be great, and now you're giving us this thing that looks all zoomed in. It's not really streamable that way. So there are some things that can help. Uh, if you're a budding you know, VR Twitch streamer and you're like, well, how do you do it? 
one of the things is the Oculus Debug Tool. There's actually a software toolkit that allows you to bring up a standardized window that comes up that works on any title. And Vive have done this for some time. They had a mirror window in their software kind of from day one, so that's easy. But getting back to your question again on Vive, not to stray too far from the path here, if I'm out and about, you know, running around my room, knocking into things with the Vive on, how do I keep an eye on, on chat? So it's primarily the messaging function, but also there are some tools that work better on Vive than Rift and don't work on PSVR at all that allow you to bring chat into forefront. We obviously just had the announcement that you know, home is going to change in a point where you can pin a window inside your virtual reality. And so there you go, there's the answer. Just get a chroma keyed version of my chat window, smack it somewhere inside my digital world. There are, there are software tools that already do that actually. So from Oculus perspective, I suppose they, they've seen what's out there, either mimicked it or came up with the same idea internally, and now they're gonna integrate it. So that should make things a lot easier for those going forward who want to do the same. Mm. Now, I imagine that there's a variety of virtual reality games that are completely immersive and amazing for you to play, but are just dreadfully, utterly boring for people to watch. Um, <laughs> and so I'm curious for you, where's that sweet spot for games that you like to play but are also great to stream? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one of the things that once you once you garner enough attention and you've got developers tapping you on the shoulder saying, hey, can you play my game, play my game. Uh, here's a key, would you mind showing it? There's a whole spectrum, right? So you're gonna have like the college, university college student who's got a project that probably isn't ready for showtime. And then on the other side, you've got like AAA stuff that is super long. Like it might actually be too much content for it. I was speaking to the Gunfire Games guys the other day, um, sorry, just yesterday, because they had this game Kronos, which was one of the kind of first like AAA titles, really. It looked like kind of like a Tomb Raider style game. Really good quality. I, I went in gung ho and was like, okay, I'm gonna play this hardcore. I didn't even get 30% through it before I had to give up. And that was 40 hours of gameplay in, and I only got 30% into the game. So there are some things. Again, like I spoke to you earlier about uh, visual variety, it's it's important that you mix it up. And how do I do that? Well, the industry kind of did it for me, right? So I've got three headsets now, right? So I'm covering those three. I don't cover. I get this question as well. I don't cover Gear VR because it's not it's not that it's not easy to stream. It's that the performance hit on the apps and the quality that comes out at the end, I don't think is matching the consistency of the rest of the show. PSVR is almost even on that low point. Uh, but with the PlayStation 4 Pro and streaming from a PC, a stream PC, then it's okay. Um, so those, those titles are good. But how do you pick? You kind of, first you have to just kind of have a dab. You have to play around. Like, is a fishing game going to be really interesting to watch? I mean, one of the ones that really surprised me, actually VR as a whole surprised me, a lot of the boring stuff is some of the more interesting things to actually showcase. Fishing and talking with a bunch of dudes is really good fun. It's like, I don't know, it's really good fun for the audience, it's really good fun for me. You can literally have an interview. I've interviewed some of some other dev teams and like sat in there chatting with them and we're just casting away. Oh, you got a pass, you know, that kind of thing. Really good fun. Euro Truck Simulator, one of my all time most popular games. Um, just driving down the road. Why? Why is that interesting to watch? I think it's something to do with the fact that you got like motion coming at you. And also, I'm not the best driver, and I tend to get quite hilarious crashes. But other than that, you know, it's that kind of stuff is really repeatable. Stuff that isn't, obviously, first-time watches, things like uh, Lucky's Tale, any single single-player playthroughs, you'll do them once, and then it drops back to that 20%. Like you wouldn't really revisit them. So you're, you instead have to kind of like be like, okay, Dev Studio, you just spent the last couple of years, you produced this great piece. Maybe it's only four to six hours long. Cover it, and then we're into you know waiting and crossing our fingers that these guys are going to have enough support to come out with another title. But there is a lot out there that's really, really good. I um, mean, we are not in a place anymore where I would even hesitate to pick up hardware. And at 399, I mean, out of yesterday's announcements, um, the sexiest announcement to me and most uninteresting, I suppose, to people is oh, it's 399 for the Rift. Well, you're talking about PC quality, you know, cabled VR in the best headset of the three. Um, in my stacking order, because uh, people always ask this question as well, it's Rift, PSVR, and Vive. 
and sometimes really are really surprised by that answer. Wow. Well, I, I do a lot of embodied, like, full room scale stuff, and for me, Vive is head and shoulders above both of those. Yeah. I think... It's like something like audio shield or sound boxing is, like, something that's really embodied. You can game. lose yourself, right? It's, yeah, it's I just like totally like... immerse myself, and so just that level of tracking and the quality and the solidity, and there's just a lot of indie games, I think, that, to me, are exciting. And also... For a lot of developers, like Google, uh, Vive is actually like a um, minimum viable product. So it's actually easier for a lot of engineers and developers to develop something for the Vive. Yeah. So you often find stuff comes out for the Vive first, and that you actually have to work around Oculus's 180 degree design constraint sure. to be able to design. So you, actually, the developers have to design around the constraints of the technology. Yeah. Yeah. So because of that, I find that you actually have a lot more innovation and just new stuff that comes sooner to the Vive than the Rift. So I would say the Vive for me personally. Yeah. But I'm not a gamer, so I don't. I'm not sort of playing the same type of games yeah. that, that you are. So I think I think from a content perspective, I did the math some time ago. Like for the price that you're paying for the hardware, the price you're paying for the software, and for the hours you get out of it. Right. Well, what three, about the degree of presence? How do you how do you degree for that? Because I feel like I get a better sense of embodied presence and active presence when it comes to the vibe. I gotta say, I gotta say, all all three are all three meet the mark at this point. You know, um, there were. You days, don't think there's any difference in yours? I mean, seeing, especially with the PlayStation VR, you get a, a huge hit with not being able to get full it's got, tracking. The it's same got a body. nicer. It, I mean, it's got a nicer SOV, to be honest. I was super surprised. Okay, you're gonna cut the price in a third, and I'm gonna go into the headset and. God, it's got a taller and a wider view. Um, yes, is the like initially when it when it first launched, I wasn't too impressed with the resolution of the headset, but um, you forget about it. I mean, one of the games that I recently got totally lost in. I mean, to the point where when you take the headset off, it's weird coming back into the world <laughs> again. Was Farpoint? You know, playing Farpoint with their gun accessory. Right, with the gun accessory, which I think is sort of like different than sort of the normal. So I would say that that's an exception because it's a special controller that's actually giving you a higher level of embodiment. That's right. I mean, it does vary very much from title to title. But still, for me, the comfort factor of the Rift is one of its primary selling points. The ease of setup. You know, I don't have to switch on any broom lasers. I don't have to... The getting in and getting out of it is actually part of, for me, as someone who does three-hour shows, it's a big chunk of it. It takes me 10 minutes to set up the Vive and two minutes to set up the Rift. You know, that's actually a piece of, of the kind of overall experience. It's one of the things we were talking very briefly about, about Battlegrounds. Battlegrounds succeeds because it is super easy to drop in and drop out of. You know, if I think back a couple of years playing like Left 4 Dead, we were queuing for like 45 minutes to find a server. It's a totally different experience. And I think in this day and age, where I just Ubered here, you know, you know, in two minutes, I get what I want, and I'm on the road. It's the exact same thing. So, in a world where we're increasingly wanting, now, now, I want to be doing the thing I want to be doing, I really appreciate what the Rift can do. Um, I think there were some bad design decisions when it comes to PSVR. This funky cable hanging off your side, so I'm really glad to hear that Sony's announced you know, the second revision of PSVR. That's cool. Um, but they obviously have, they don't have the touch control. They really need a new solution. So, for me, from a it's more from a, like a, a punch for price. I think that you know that's why I have the three and four Rift PSVR five. But that's not to say that Vive is like losing it anyway. All three are competitors in a very strong field, and there's things that the Vive can make you do because of the immersive factor of it that the others maybe struggle to do. You know, you can't wander around so much, um, but there aren't that many titles that make real good use of... Rick and Morty, I think, is probably the best. Rick and Morty's pretty good. I, mean, I like the Rick and Morty also scales. I don't have the biggest room in the world, but that's part of the fun factor. Uh, you know, smashed a light bulb, nearly broke my fist on a on, on, on punching something when I was playing Gorn. These kinds of things can happen. And people are like, well, why don't you like, upgrade, go to the bigger room or whatever? Actually, it's part of the fun factor, to be honest, for the viewers, because somebody might hit something, you know? <laughs> Paintings and metal in the back get knocked around. So, I don't know. The three headsets are fantastic. Um, I'm just glad to be where we are at the moment, seeing this kind of new wave of where people are pushing to, you know, reducing cost. It's a really important piece of the puzzle. That's why I was, I just had a big grin on my face when I saw the two channels of announcement yesterday with uh, Oculus Go being, thankfully, the, the godsend for those who can't afford premium VR, and then, 
you know, you've got other other kind of headsets now coming that are you know, promised to us in future years that are going to do inside-out tracking. I think that'll be quite interesting, to be honest, because I don't think from a gaming experience you're going to lose much. Um, because with the tracking volume that they've got, they've probably done the stats. It's probably like 95% of the time your hands are in that space. It's very rare that you have it down the back. Well, I think that uh, with the video game market, you have mobile games, you have console games, and you have PC games. I feel like a similar ecosystem is evolving for virtual reality, where you're going to have the, the Gear VR and Daydream games. Uh, then you're going to have the console games, which right now is split between the PSVR, but also with these emerging standalone headsets that are going to be completely self-contained, both with the Oculus Go as well as the Santa Cruz from, from Oculus. Uh, and potentially other HTC Vive and Samsung, I expect, will probably be announcing some of their own standalone headsets. And then you have um, the PC virtual reality with both Oculus Rift as well as the HTC Vive, and then post VR is kind of fledgling behind. And, and also the Windows Mixed Reality headsets that are just going to be coming out as well, which are kind of like the lower end of the PC VR, but able to still uh, have access to some of the Steam games. And so I expect that we'll start to see a similar uh, fragmentation when it comes to the uh, graphics fidelity and the capabilities when it comes to those three areas. And then, you know, digital out of home, location based entertainment is going to be a whole other, like haptics, a whole other realm. I think there's going to be a return of the VR arcades, which is going to be a whole other thing. But I see that there, there's the mobile VR, the uh, console VR, and then the PC VR, where I do expect with the console VR, there's going to be things like shooting a bow and arrow and putting a, your hand behind your head. That's something like um, with the Valve, the lab, where they have that those shooting games, where that is going to be something that I think is going to be a good test for this um, inside-out tracking for something like the same games, which I'll be trying out later today. Good luck to you. That, 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 that's going to be fun, I think. Catch a oh, so just to just to comment on how, so I guess the just how the um, we have these different areas of both mobile gaming, console gaming, and PC gaming. So I I predict there'll be just as much differences between console gaming and PC gaming, where there's there's some sort of stylistic differences in how you play different games, and I think there's going to be a similar subtle difference that happens in VR. Te well. Technology is going to make that difference. I think I think there's it's 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 going to be very. It's going to be very difficult, as you say, to probably distinctly compartmentalize them aside from the kind of technology. But they will certainly develop into their own channels. Um, but someone like me needs to think about is, well, how the heck am I going to be taking an image out of a completely all-in-one package? How do I get an image out of it? It's possible. Um, I've got some friends who've tinkered with and gotten images out of, for instance, HoloLens, which otherwise, when I first tried it, like this is this is going to be a bit of a challenge. You know, all the processing is on board. Can I even get a video feed out of this thing? How is that going to work? Thankfully, from what I've heard in terms of their structuring and software side, that the the hardware is going to be compatible with taking video feeds out. Of course, it will because if you think about it, you know, one guy standing in a room playing a VR title, right, versus that person with a mirror window and everyone can watch what that person is seeing. Those are two incredibly different experiences. And I think the evocative um, relationship that is present when you have an audience and a participant to VR, not even necessarily multiplayer VR, but just literally an audience, that's a fantastic vibe. Anyone who's been on convention floor feels that. You, know, you, you see a game, you hear a shout, you hear you know, some woman yelping because she's just... Uh, you know, she's, she's standing on a skyscraper and thinks she's about to fall off the building. You know, these kinds of things are incredibly entertaining. So for someone like myself, um, I, I just love watching the development of how developers answer the question. How do I entertain, educate, you know, uh, broaden the horizons of their audiences, of those, you know, ingesting their content. And I'm just so thankful for that because it's totally changed. It's just totally changed my world. You know, just, just, just engaging with this stuff. I mean, there must be something that you've experienced in VR and thought, oh my God, you know, things are just so different. Yeah, I think probably Google Earth was one of those experiences where I just saw, oh, yeah. like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can go anywhere in the world. And just the, the sense of being able to map out the emotional architecture of my life by going to all the places I used to live and to be able to, to recontextualize my, the story and meaning of places that I've been and, and, who I, and how that makes who I am. I think stuff like that has been just mind-blowing. And 
uh, I, I guess from you, I got, I'm curious, like, what have been some of your most favorite experiences, both the both experience, but also to stream to your audience? We've had some, we've had some really fun ones. Um, I mentioned Euro Truck Simulator; that was one of our early ones. Um, we decided. I just want to, to say one quick thing, there, just because uh, we talked about player unknown battlegrounds, where yeah. I mean, just sort of getting swept into like once I heard that it was the top game. I, and that it was like sort of a really popular stream. I started watching it. And I was like, "What is what is going on here?" And it, it's actually, uh, it, like objectively, it's kind of boring in the first parts of it. people are gathering and then suddenly they make it killed. But they're 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 looting and then they're walking around a lot. But it actually makes a good stream game because you have that same similar kind of casual like ability to have a partial attention to it, but also pay attention and, and have a conversation. And so it's interesting that you've mentioned some of the games like your truck simulator where you're driving a car, but yet you're still able to like connect to your audience so, in that way and have kind of a partial attention. To it. I, I attribute it to, it's not, it's not too far different from kind of like podcasting, right? So you can, you can kind of tune in. A lot of the best stream titles are ones you can kind of tune in or tune out of, and also that tend to spike and grab your attention. So, for instance, you know, if there's a near miss on the road or something like that, that that's when things spike up. The, the the situation when you ask the question about you know favorite memories, one of the things with with, with my wife, we kind of co-stream sometimes. So she'll pop into the scene as kids are down and. And um, we'll be able to, to do different things. One of them that we do, um, back to the Euro Truck one at the moment, is like using Quill for Pictionary. And again, as I said, we have kind of a point system that allows people to message and also uh, if they want to auction on various items, keys, game keys, physical goods and things that we have, um, they can win some points if they are able to first guess what like, my wife is drawing. So she'll be drawing, let's say, a volcano. People are just guessing, 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 every now what their guesses are. And then when they win, do a, you know, a buzzer and award the points and keep going. And it makes for a really interactive uh, stream. Actually, it's probably the one where all the lurkers in chat, anyone who's a Twitch streamer knows, you'll probably have, I don't know, 30% of your audience engaged in chat. But this one really draws people out. Because they're like, I, I know what that is and I have to say it. So I have to say it, it's, it's a goose. It's definitely a goose, you know? And then just using it, <laughs> goose, 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 wombat, you know, just all these crazy things. It makes for a really good thing to stream. And it's actually really fun in our rebroadcasts as well. Because you're just listening along, you're like, you can't remember quite what it was. And so you're guessing along as well. And even though you were the one there maybe drawing it or whatever, it's, it's, it's great fun. Oh, wow, that's really fascinating that you're really actually engaging people in the actual stream. And, yeah. Uh, I know that uh, VReal has had some technology where they're, they're working on things to potentially have some way to immerse people into the scene. Have you played with VReal or find other ways to actually immerse your audience into your I, 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 I'm, a, I'm, a very, uh, I'm a very critical eye when it comes to technologies. Uh, like yourself, you've got an engineering background. And it, for me, it's kind of a keeper kill. So when VReal reached out, we're like, here's this technology. I love the concept of it. But the fact that you have to kind of, like VR, designed by the ground up in order to take advantage of that technology, I see some real challenges in that. Um, I would love to try it with a title that's like fully bought into and plugged into the real, which is essentially for those listening or watching, it's something that allows the audience to participate in the virtual reality environment. So you and I could be... Or passively watch as well. Or passively yeah, yeah. watch, but you could be standing there. You could be... Um, the closest thing to that that I would say I've, I've kind of been involved with was like in alt space, they used to have events which were comedians, Bill Nye, you know, these kinds of you know, hosts come along. And you would be part of an audience that could interact directly or interact like indirectly and with the other audience members. So you know, if a really good bit is on stage, you might whisper to the guy to your left or a girl to your right, you might be like, oh my god, that was a good bit. Right? And so those experiences are really interesting because they open up the avenue for friendships to be made. And I think that of course the social element of VR is is, is, a, is a huge driving force for it. It is like a force of nature. And the more your your software, your title, uh, draws that out and allows people to very readily get to know one another or puts them in a situation where they, they need to work together, then boom, you know, friendships are there on the table. I mean, I, I bring it back to games like, like DayZ, uh, not too far off, you know, Battlegrounds, you know, spawning routes for these things where you're surviving together and, you know, if that person dies, 
in the game. You might have lost a real life friend because you didn't exchange details, you didn't get a chance to say goodbye or whatever. And I'm finding that in some of the newer titles. There's a there's a brand new title coming out next month that I am absolutely smitten called From Other Sons. And it is a three person, you're on a ship, it's like a game called Faster Than Light, uh, which was like a 2D, very indie style game. And you've got a spaceship, there's fires on board, there's alien attacks, and you're just trying to keep yourself alive and take a couple of space jumps over to get to Earth, and then you're sorted, right? That's the objective. Same thing in this. And I was in with like, from the Windlands team, John Hibbins, uh, a couple of my buddies, and we're just piloting around, taking over the enemy ship. But the options that you have, and the situations where you're literally working together to kind of fix very uh, heart-beating situations, it just bonds you, like straight away. And there's people on, uh, on the internet who are like, who are you? You know, I want to know who you are so we can play this more together. And I, that is the thing I play games for. I don't play games to play single player. Um, and actually, I've been on to do like the Euro Truck devs time and time again. I'm like, guys, you have an Oculus branch. You have the Game Boy supported. Just bring it into your main branch so we can do multiplayer. Because there's a mod, a big popular mod, where there's literally 2,000 players driving around Berlin, uh, all with their own trucks in this. And if you crash, you pay for that. Like, not with real world money, but your in-game money that you've earned over time. And, and that is a fantastic experience. And actually, it led me to Twitch streaming. And then VR took off, and I love that. And I just we just took it from that point and moved forward. So it's it's really been a fantastic journey. But I think things like from other sons, it's just coming out. I mean, it's such a good thing. I mean, it's the kind of experience that people can't afford to miss. You have to you have to try some of these things out because I think the engaging factor of it is something that so many people are going to miss. And it, it kind of hurts me a little bit to think that. Even when I go to show floors now, if I go to a convention in the UK, this is a really tough statistic, but I can tell you, it's probably 70 to 80% of people haven't tried proper VR, like PC level, any of the three headsets that I mentioned. They may have tried beer, they may have tried cardboard. The majority of them still haven't tried VR. They've heard about it, you know? But maybe they got a friend, or they don't have a friend who's got it. And that's crushing to me. I'm four years into this, and it's it's like, how can you not? Try this out. It's it's a new world, mm -hmm. and so that that to me is probably the hardest thing right now is just seeing people who haven't been baptized yet it's, uh, into this wonderful world of. I mean, the education side, even you know, like you mentioned, Google Earth, being able to revisit a place that you've been before or check out a place, and you're kind of life hacking in, right? I mean, I'm going to go visit Paris. Oh, well, what's it like? What's the street like? Oh, that looks a little bit dodgy. Maybe I'll pick a different Airbnb. You know, those things to me are already creeping into our lives. In a way that you know that that kind of 3D geometry, that um, environment that you can place yourself in now, and that you can experience with other people, is really a very strong experience. And I actually think that, like what Octopus was saying yesterday, I tried out Facebook Spaces, and that was my first time trying their uh, their new software build. You know, it, it's it's going to have an impact. It's going to have an impact in the working world. You know, those of us, um, I think it was what Zuckerberg said yesterday. You know, it's like. <laughs> The PC is something that today most of us spend, you know, a chunk of every day of our lives on. I think VR is just the next thing there. I really believe it. And I believe it wholeheartedly since I first stepped in and this was, I came out of it and it felt like coming out of the matrix. It was like, my God, you know, welcome back to the real world. And uh, VR is just, uh, VR, VR is a way forward. And once you're into it, and this is the thing where people who say, you know, TV, TV, it's not really it, it, it's, it's one of the things that drives me to continue streaming. There are times when you're like, this is tough. Because you know? it can be, as I said, it can be very draining if you're having to do full on multiple realities, you know, and you can get physically tired. You know? I've got a corporate job, so you know, I come home from that and, and, and I'm doing shows from 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. After my kids are in bed, you know, and, uh, and then back to sleep, back to work next day. So, and what I'm doing right now is I'm branching out from that. So the reason I'm here at Oculus Connect is uh, SciTech Games, who just launched Moonlands 2. I'm happy to give them a little bit of a plug here because absolutely brilliant thing. Uh, I personally think uh, it's best of show. The colors, and if anyone hasn't tried it yet, I think they really, really should. They are a colorful game. They're really building into their own niche, kind of like Zelda did as a franchise. And uh, for anyone who's a fan of Doom and Sandworms, that opening sequence, I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned the social games, I, I'm realizing that within virtual reality, there's like these completely new genres that I, I think take on a whole other uh, experience. When I think of like Star Trek: The Pool, where you're like, you know, actually role playing and embodied within these characters on, on you know, this sort of imaginal um, spaceship on uh, our uh, USS Aegis or you know, Star Trek universe, but also in something like Werewolves Within, which is a social deduction game, trying to like uh, trick other people and playing, or um, just even uh, something like Lone Echo, which is a little bit more of a, I guess, an embodied, you know, esports game. So uh, these different types of either multiplayer or Echo social Arena. Games, just choose it here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Lone Echo and Echo Arena. You, you meant, oh, so yeah. the esports game is Echo Arena, but actually Lone Echo is is a game. It's worth talking about. The first couple of hours in that game were well, like touched my soul. I mean, it, that sounds really like hippie, but it is theory how good quality, high frame rate, facing off to a character that treats you like a human being. I mean, the characterization of that is incredibly strong. And even when you reach down, you look at your like robot hands. Someone had said that to me before I played the game. I was like, you really clear hands on it. You just go, wow, detail level that they've got it. It really is feeling for the light. A lot of these titles. And that means they've been working on it for years. You know, this is not something that, like, the golden egg has just dropped out of the tree. Like, these things, there are people, not just enthusiasts, right? There are major firms around the world pushing this. And that's why, to me, it's so surprising when someone hasn't even experienced it once. And it's like, it's, it's a total cop smack. So, what I'm trying to do now, right? I mean, if we think about this more from uh, what drives me to you know, put my show on every, yeah, every night that I do, you know, put this broadcast on, spread the good word. Um, it it really is to kind of help the soul because it, it I'm a catalyst. You're a catalyst. You know, helping people understand what the technology is about, where it can go, and also bringing people into the fold who aren't techies, who are going to think about these things a totally different way and develop something new and exciting. I really think that we were having a laugh, uh, Semitic Bruce and I, yesterday, because we were joking about how like. You know, back in the day, we had to carry textbooks to class. Bag full of textbooks. We back breaking to the point where, like, <laughs> the, the, the parent teacher association is like, you, you can't have kids carry more than six textbooks, you know, because <laughs> you'll be hurting them. Um, these days, they've got an iPad or something like that. And so, um, what's it going to be tomorrow? You know, it's like, I don't know, government issued uh, VR headsets that you can pop into and learn your whole curriculum and maybe not even have to leave your, maybe not even leave your house. Just stay with your family, get a little bit more. Uh, you know, that kind of wigwam effect of staying in these natural communities. And I really think the face of the, the planet is shaping a lot. A lot of people are working from home these days. A lot of people are, um, you know, doing what they do at the best of their game from wherever they plenty want. Mm. Yeah. And that is a huge power. So for me at the moment, and um, just to finish off what I said a little bit earlier, like I, I came in with SciTech Games, they tapped me and they said, look, I didn't want your opinion. And I started up what I call my Zoom Hire Services. You know, people want to want to get my hand in, you know, I've been through 500 VR titles. I produce a little bit of a report scoring and say, here you guys go, this is where you need to improve. Uh, for instance, they had issues on their, their sound landscape and really needed to improve that before the show. Um, and they, they really pegged it. So it really is great to be, you know, hard and truthful with development teams and then see them take value out of that make changes and reap the benefit from it. And I think that, for me, that really makes me tick. Um, because I just, I want to see them do better. Because internally, I'm ultra grateful that they spend their lives developing content that I get to enjoy. Because for a lot of developers, they will develop it, spend all those hours doing it. And the people who actually get to reap the, the feedback cycle, oftentimes are people who are content creators or broadcasters. Um, I think even the YouTube guys, they don't get to see much of the feedback. Twitch, is, uh, Twitch and live streaming in general is such a power because it's that direct feedback. It's that human contact. You really feel, you feel the feedback. And so for people liking games and whatever, and, and I would say like, you asked me earlier, right? what's that, that kind of rainbow span of, of content? And, and, you know, what do you bring to the show? It's like a Mystery Science Theater 3000, if you're familiar with that show. Um, you can have a rubbish game from an indie game and be giving them constructive feedback at the same time as having a laugh, joking about bugs in the game or poor design decisions, and make it really entertaining for the audience. But actually the stuff that's like ultra competitive, like Echo Arena, it's not really good to watch, to be honest. Maybe once you're a skilled 
streamer, like what we saw on stage last night. But for someone like me, there's not a lot of scope for entertainment in a game like that. So I'll, I'll cover it, I'll play it once or twice, and then we kind of leave it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. The, the whole other dimension of the story and your character and the entertainment quality that you bring. But you're also, you said you've been through 500 titles, but you may be one of the people that has played the most, you know, games that, I, that I've met. I mean, I'm sure there's other people, but that consistently each and every day. I think it's difficult for people to cultivate a daily practice in virtual reality. And because you've been, you've been exploring all these games, I'm just curious, like, what's left for you? Like, what do you want to really experience in VR? I, uh, I think I think that's I think that won't be extinguished probably for the next twenty years. Seeing what I'm seeing still, I mean, like from other sons dropped literally. Uh, one of my moderators was like, "Zim, do you know about this? It just went open beta today." I was like, "Never even heard of this game." Jumped into it. Sixteen hours spent over the three days. Like I was just infatuated, and I still am. Gun for your guys, guys downstairs. I had a big hug with them last night because, my God, I just you know I love their stuff and hearing their feedback. It, it always surprises me when devs dev teams tune in and they're like, "That was bloody awesome!" Like that was so fun to watch you bumble about. Didn't realize there was anything but a pistol for the first hour, and like they get a huge entertainment value. And they also get that feedback of, well, this guy, again, not necessarily skillful, uh, this is what that path is. I mean, my, my, my core viewers know that a game that's four hours long will take me eight hours to complete. Unboxing, right, even as a small thing, probably two to three hours, if not more. So, you know, if you're in for it, you're in for it for the long run, but I tend to kind of amp it up a little bit. I like to, you know, push our push our brand a little bit and just keep things exciting and change it up. Without being a little bit, without being too, too crazy, I'm not going to eat a habanero pepper on stream or things like that, <laughs> but we do like to change it up and just to keep things fresh. Because I ask myself, what would I want to watch? And the type of people who I like to watch on Twitch and on YouTube, um, are those people who just keep changing. Well, there's things that is entertainment, entertaining for your audience, but what do you personally want to experience in VR? Oh, right. So, in terms of me personally, I want to see... There's games like Orbis VR, which is a, a, a massively multiplayer online game. Where you pick a number of classes, and you can be with like a party of like six people roaming the countryside, taking monsters down, this kind of thing. Someone's spell casting with like actual physical drawing of symbols. Uh, another person has to be skillful with a bow to hit things. So there's like a, a real skill element, plus the game element, plus social. When that triumvirate comes together in the right way, you are just lost at sea. And those are the best experiences. So I want to see that done for a hundred different concepts, you know? be a pirate on the open seas, uh, be a car mechanic, uh, all these different things. And without it, you know, there's a lot of popular titles out there, like uh, like Job Simulator and, and uh, uh, Super Hot, things like that. And I know they're like winning all the awards right now, but if you ask me, those are not the best experiences you can have in VR. They really just don't. They're, they're teasers or tasters, and it's kind of like the old um, Pepsi Challenge where people would put down a little bit of Coke, a little bit of Pepsi, and it's like, 9 out of 10 people preferred Pepsi. Well, it's because it was that bit sweeter, and in that small proportion, it tastes really good. But if you're like someone like me, and you know, you're reading novels equivalently in VR, then you want something a little bit more holistic. Uh, something like a, like a Resident Evil or a, or a Kronos, or longer experiences, but not even necessarily. I love indie titles that are like an hour to three hours long, because they're really bite-sized. Uh, people love a good story, start to finish. Love a, a different art style. Um, I just played in Gear VR, and I, I wish I could show it to my audience, but I won't be able to, I don't think. Uh, a, a, a game called Dispatch on Gear VR. Um, very, it's not even a game, it's like an experience where you're seeing like 911 calls, and the art style in that, and the emotional landscape that they paint in it, I'm really impressed, and it runs super silky smooth, and the audio, the voice, the voice artists behind it, like, applause to them, because it's scary listening to some of that stuff. And there's a woman who's, who's, who's about to get probably beaten or killed by a man who's assaulting her, that kind of thing in this, really well done, and it puts you in the seat of a guy who doesn't really want to be sitting behind the 911, you know, phone call. And it's a very uh, soulful experience, and something that I would recommend people check out, because there's not much on gear that's impressed me, um, being frank, and so I, I'm not really attracted to that as a platform, but there are a few small titles that I've, I've touched on that, and they're, they're ones that, if you are in Gear VR, 
you have to try. It's kind of like casino VR poker. Uh, that was one of the first real social experiences I had, and you might think, that's a bit odd, right? Just playing a card game. But if you're a poker player, one of the things that you, and I am, I've been doing kind of poker tournaments and running that myself since university days, and I really like because again, it's the social side of it. It's, it's, it's similar to kind of like being in the truck cab. You get to talk to people. You get to understand who they are as a person. You get to know their tells and things like that. And for the first time, I can see when you move a slight little bit that you you didn't before. Slight head nod, slight turn, um, and you can pick up reads off that. That's amazing. Like someone's sitting off in a casino in Vegas, and I'm in Scotland, and we're playing a playing a playing a game together, and I can beat the guy because of the tells I pick up off of him because of VR. Uh, so much to the point where there's quite a disconnect between how Rift there was full 360, you know, full positional tracking and gear, which is just you know. Three degrees. Um, so, as a as 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 an environment, one of the things that I want to try, I want to see what indies have for me. To be honest, I'm I'm really matched with the experience, and I certainly don't shy away from broken things. And I do think that people should, rather than trying to get their titles perfect, get them out there. Don't shy away from the fact that there is a little bit of acidic relationship with you know early access and things like that. Just you know, get your get your stuff out there. Get it into the hands of people who are, you know, who who are. The term is OG, I think. You know, who've been around, who've tried things since 2014, 2015, and have that breadth of experience. Get some positive feedback from them. You know, but don't don't worry about putting you know that stuff out there because you've got a great game concept. You're not too far away from kind of developing your feedback and finishing. You should. You should spend that quality time. You should uh, get that feedback. And although feedback in that loop can burn a little bit, um, be prepared to be prepared to just kind of knuckle down and, and take it because that might be your first VR title. By the time you get to VR title three, you'll be nine leaps ahead of the competition because you you were you were able to kind of go through those loops of growth. And that's what it is. I think it's you know, Indies want to grow, and I just want to grow with them. And, uh, and finally, what do you think is kind of the ultimate potential of virtual reality and what it might be able to enable? That's a really good question. As a man who met his wife on a bus for the Nintendo DS, I'm going to answer that finding the love of your life is the ultimate potential for VR. Because if you can connect with somebody in such a way that you virtually meet and then you find yourselves in the same place. I can't think of a better answer to your question. Mm. Awesome. Is there anything else that's left unsaid that you would like to say? Uh, probably just, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just let them know my channel. So, um, guys, you can find me at, at twitch.tv slash zimtalk5. Uh, people call me Zim, so I'll uh, see you around. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Ken. Cheers. All right, guys, hopefully the battery's still going. Let me check that. <laughs> See how it's going. Yeah, nearly low battery. Okay, cool. Oh, so we made it. We made it. Woo! Woo! That was great. Oh, thanks for that. That was good. Yeah, yeah. It's really nice to just have a chat. And yeah, yeah. That was great to get your whole story and to, to get a window into a world that I've never really dipped into. There really aren't so... There, I'm surprised that... I know it takes a lot of work. You no, know? yeah. I mean, sitting down and streaming a game like Battlegrounds is literally a two-minute... Hayes is going to kill me. <laughs> But it's more of a two-minute job. Once you have it all configured, and yeah. set up, yeah. um, actually broadcasting the game, you don't have many problems technically to deal with. Yeah. But VR games are rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's but but of... the way I've the way I've approached that since the very 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 beginning, um, just like I said, if I'm going to try something for the first time, I will I will I will just uh, show them warts and all. So I will try to get the game launching live, and yeah. I will if it fecks up and it doesn't work, then. So be it, you know, we'll move on to a different title or we'll struggle together or someone will be hunting on Reddit for answers and we'll right, right. get it working. But what that gives people is an honest answer to yeah. what is it like right. yeah. to be, you know, invested in VR. Uh, right. Yeah. And it has improved substantially over time. Yeah, but they've been right. able to see that, you know, and so that's to me, just being frank with people is the most important thing. Yeah, and you're on the front lines of that. I know no, I've seen some videos that recently somebody who were in the gaming world and then you know basically saying oh 
VR is dead or whatnot, all sort of looking at things. Talking, like, I think, or someone. Like, yeah, something like looking at the high level, like AAA games and stuff. But I, from my direct experience of being at these conferences and meeting people like yourself who have been mm. invested, actually in, embedded within the VR gaming community, that there's a rich ecosystem. That to me, is exciting uh, that it's it's still growing and evolving, but uh, it's enough to capture your attention to this degree and for you to be doing this. It's a good, it's a good indicator. But it's also you're in the trenches, you know, doing that work. So. Yeah, I actually just think that I, I think I think it's got really long legs. I, I don't see how VR could possibly you turn and go away. Yeah. I really don't. No, I don't either. I'm I mean, all in. I, I same here. I mean, it's just like <laughs> good reference because I said the poker thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna finish the show there. Kent, thank you very much for joining yeah, me. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. thank you. And uh, guys, we're gonna wrap there. I'll probably get a photo and drop it out to Twitter. So, guys, my battery's almost dead. I'll be back a bit later on. I gotta charge up first, and then we'll see you guys in a bit later. Thanks for watching.